Here we go. We can we could go off on a little bit of a wild tangent, can't we? <laughs> can we have a little fun? <laughs> Let's see. Tell us an astronomy joke, Andrew. <laughs> How many astronomers does it take to screw in a light bulb? The answer is none. Why would you want to have light? <laughs> I can use that one. Yeah, that's right. Astronomers that's don't need light bulbs. All right. So this picture of you, uh, uh, obviously, you're in, you're giving a lecture. Do you remember uh, when this was done? This is 2017, and I'm speaking about the eclipse. Ah, I okay. believe it's an eclipse sky behind me, and I don't know where I'm. It might be Google that I'm giving the talk, or a club in San Francisco. I see. That's true. Okay, so now. Try to share this on your, we'll see if we can do this. Share it on your page. So I have that it's two. There you are. Okay, you can look at your Facebook page and see if it's up there. And then I'm gonna share this to some groups because they like to watch this show. What groups did you share with Scott? Facebook astronomy group and... Oh yeah, that's definitely one of them. Uh, the Neil deGrasse Tyson group, um, Atlanta Astronomy Club, several others. I belong to a lot of them. Telescope addicts. How many telescopes do you have to have to be classified as an addict? I don't know. Maybe none. You know, certainly people that are extremely interested in them but don't own one. Andrew, that looks like a grog of mead almost. <laughs> oh, what I'm drinking. Oh, it's, yep. it's, it's just guava juice. Could pass for a big old, like I said, a big old grog of mead. Yeah. Well, yes, I'm also part of the Fellowship of the Rings. Astronomy education, let's share it with them. Astronomy education in India, how about that? This is cool. Okay. You better quit sharing so much, you're going to go into Facebook jail, Scott. They don't let you do that anymore. You know, they, they kind of, uh, they see you getting hyperactive, they'll just, uh, they just stop it, you know. They, they don't let you do it and then say, okay, you're going into jail for two weeks, you know. At least that's the way it seems today. But I've definitely been in Facebook jail before. For oversharing. For oversharing. Not quite sure how you can overshare, but... There's a
there's one thing that stands between us and the harsh environment of space, our atmosphere, the part of Earth that sustains all life. But here, in the closest town to the North Pole, it's slowly leaking away. A team headed there to launch rockets into the leak, but it's not the lack of atmosphere that they're concerned about. The leak is a natural process that will take billions of years, so we're not going to run out anytime soon. It's part of the larger story of how a planet's atmosphere changes over time, a key factor in the search for life on other planets. We have 35 residents and 60 of our team together in a town that is completely isolated. There's a plane twice a week, and there's a thousand polar bears nearby. This is Doug Rowland, a NASA scientist who's taken his team to Neolison on the island of Svalbard. The island lies beneath one of two regions near Earth's poles called the cusps. It's where we can access space directly and where a hundred tons of atmosphere escapes into space each day. This escape gives clues to how long an atmosphere will last and ultimately whether it stays around long enough to sustain life. What we're trying to understand is how did Earth's atmosphere evolve over time? And how do other planets that might be like Earth or, or more dissimilar to Earth, how did their atmospheres evolve? So Doug joined forces with Joran Moen, a professor at the University of Oslo, who started the Grand Challenge Initiative, CUSP. It's an international mission to launch 12 rockets into the Earth's northern cusp. And Doug, he's the mission leader for the first two rockets of the campaign. We don't want to waste our rocket. It takes us three years to make the rocket and only 15 minutes to use it. And I don't want to waste my shot here. He's using a sounding rocket, which is different from the bigger rockets that carry satellites and humans into space. It's a small suborbital rocket that flies briefly into space, collects real-time data for around 15 minutes, then falls back to Earth. It's affordable, quick to build, and can launch towards a precise point. The major advantage is that you can launch uh, into a target on the sky. But there's a limited launch window and only one chance to get the launch right. We have these unguided rockets. They go where you point them, unless the wind is blowing, because the wind literally just blows them over. We don't launch when there's high wind. So to measure the winds, they launch balloons with GPS trackers. They're released every 15 to 30 minutes, and then they're monitored to see how fast the winds are carrying them. Ground winds were 12, 13 meters per second, gusting 17, which is uh, way off. You're filled with trepidation. Oh my gosh, this thing that I built, is it going to work after all this? So I think we're going to scrub for today. I'd like to thank everyone. I think it was a great performance. Thanks a lot. This means that we are scrubbing this operation for today and we'll try again tomorrow. The mission is named Visualizing Ion Outflow via Neutral Atom Sensing 2, or Visions 2. In short, they're looking at how oxygen is getting enough energy to escape. It's a good test of how atmospheric escape works. Earth's gravity should hold onto the oxygen, and yet we see this gas shooting off into space. We're trying to figure out how that works. That is a science question that has been uh, hanging around for four decades. Fortunately, anyone can see atmospheric escape at the right place and time. In Svalbard, we have the so-called polar night. It's dark all 24 hours. Its continual darkness is key for witnessing this. This is the cusp aurora. It's a type of northern lights that appears between 8 a.m. and noon, and you can only see it when it's dark during the day. It looks similar to the aurora that occurs at night, but when these iridescent colors dance at this hour each day, a hundred tons of oxygen escapes from Earth's atmosphere into space. This is our sport now to, to, to chase the aurora. Working with them is the ISCAT radar and Chell Henriksen Observatory. They have additional instruments to find the aurora. Sometimes it's cloudy, so we use uh, radars to track the cusp. We can give advice that this is the right type of aurora. This is the Wall of Science, a collection of data from satellites and ground instruments that helps them predict where the cusp aurora will be. So the cusp actually isn't a fixed point in space, it kind of moves around. What's controlling the cusp's movement is the sun interacting with Earth. 
Our planet is surrounded by a magnetic field that helps us hold on to our atmosphere. But at the North and South Poles, the magnetic field bends inwards, creating a corridor between Earth and space. When energy is released from the sun via a solar flare or a coronal mass ejection, all of that energy in the form of radiation rides down the magnetic field lines of the Earth and is transferred and dumped into the Earth's atmosphere. Electrons cascade into Earth's atmosphere. They accelerate and collide with oxygen particles, giving them energy to release light and sometimes enough energy to escape. Collectively, this forms the cusp aurora and streams of escaping oxygen. This cusp is in constant motion. And we've got a fixed trajectory. We really can't aim at where the cusp is. We have to wait for the cusp to come across our line of sight. Can you guys hear Chelmar? We'd like you, as soon as you see an indication the cusp is moving close, to move it, the radar dish if we can. This is IceCat. It's been very quiet, very difficult to launch. No. <laughs> Probably about a 60% chance of launching. When we started seeing this really good data, this clock started counting down, and that's when everyone realized, this is going to happen. We're oh, going wow. to launch. We're doing everything we can to, to get that launch off before the aurora goes away. It is really, really challenging and nerve-wracking at that point. Uh, you can see the tension just rise. <laughs> and everybody when that, when that happens. And so everyone's watching their instruments, getting really excited, and then at T minus one minute, all of us ran out to go see the launch happen. And then we immediately turned. Well, hello everybody. This is Scott Roberts with Explore Scientific, and this is you're watching the First Flight Chronicles with uh, Kent Martz and our special guest, um, Andrew Fracknoy. He's a professor of uh, of, a, of I think is uh, the title astronomy. Professor, a professor of astronomy. Absolutely. Yeah. I um, uh, pulled down some information about. Uh, about Andrew, uh, although I have known him for a long time. I think I met him initially in the 1980s. Uh, I, I was uh, relating, to, um, relating to him that um, I um, cold called him one time after hearing about uh, this, um, this amazing guy that was doing all, all of this uh, work up in the Bay Area uh, to uh, enlighten people about astronomy. Uh, and uh, everybody was saying, yeah, you got to meet, uh, you got to talk to Andrew Fracknoy. And so I just got his number and I just called him. And I really did not believe I was actually going to get to talk to the guy. You know, it was, it was uh, I had admired him so much. Um, and, you know, over the years of uh, learning about what uh, Andrew Fracknoy has done through his educational outreach programs, through his lectures, through books that he's written, uh, his, his, uh, his presence in the uh, astronomical community, uh, he's really kind of like one of my heroes. And so, you know, I'm really, really honored to have him on the show today. Uh, you know, it, it, I guess if I was a musician and admired other great iconic mu musicians, well, to me, Andrew Fracknoy is one of these iconic people in astronomy. And uh, um, so, uh, uh, he has come on our show today. He's going to do two programs. This will be the first one. This one, we're just going to get to know uh, Andrew Fracknoy. If you don't know about him, um, uh, you know, he was uh, born in Hungary in 1948. Is that right? Scott, Scott I, let me interrupt you. I'm so sorry. I think we had a kind of miscommunication okay. about the how the show was going to go. Okay. And I'm really embarrassed to say that I have to go pretty soon because I every okay. week at this time I help my wife with a class that I'm the Zoom technician for. Ah, so I really okay. apologize that I didn't know this no, was no. going to go along. So I would say let's get we can talk about me another time, but All let's right. get down to talking about the meeting and. I really apologize that I didn't understand no the schedule. I'll, I'll cover this with our audience later then. That's no problem. 
That's no problem. So, anyways, you did have a you had a PowerPoint presentation that you wanted to uh, share with us, and so so, so let, let me begin. First of all, thank you so much for having me on the show. I've been a real admirer of yours as well. We call you the indefatigable Scott Roberts in astronomy outreach circles. So, <laughs> I thank you. Really appreciate this, and as you would have said, if I'd given you a chance. Uh, as part of my career in astronomy, I served as the executive director of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific, which right. you've been involved with for many years. It's an organization devoted to doing what you do on an international level to spread the word about astronomy to teachers, students, mm -hmm. uh, amateur astronomers, and the public. And uh, every year since its founding in 1889, this organization has a meeting where we share something about astronomy and astronomy education at a national level or international level. And this year, of course, no one's having any meetings, as you know, because of the pandemic, uh, everybody has to meet uh, remotely. And in the same way, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific is having a remote meeting on a subject uh, dear to the hearts of your listeners, which is astronomy education and outreach. And so, um, I wanted to tell your, your viewers and listeners a little bit about what's happening with this meeting, which is in December. So I'm going to share my screen, as you said, and I'm going to set things up so everyone can see. Uh, as I say, the Astronomical Society of the Pacific is an old organization. Uh, the, the god Mercury in mythology who uh, spreads the word about heavenly things and is the messenger of the heavens is our symbol. And uh, December 3 through 5, we're going to have this virtual meeting on astronomy education. Here's the website that you go to to find out more, astrosociety.org. And the main threads of the meeting, as you might imagine, have to do with current events <laughs> in the world of astronomy education, including teaching astronomy remotely during the uh, pandemic. How do we handle suddenly going online. I'll say more about that in a minute. Um, and also what's happening with the climate, which a lot of people are concerned about and how scientists are involved with that. And also with dark skies, the whole issue about how we keep our skies dark so that observers like the people who watch your program can continue and enjoy the sky. And then uh, we are all, I think, concerned about equity and inclusion and how we get everyone to be part of the astronomical community and, and don't keep anyone out. Um, and then we are in schools, not the only ones who are dealing with these issues. Uh, outreach organizations like science museums and planetaria are also worrying about this. So we also include a little bit about how they're coping and much more about astronomy education. And this will be a virtual meeting that anyone can join from your computer by Zoom, much as you're joining uh, First Light Chronicles. Um, and I thought that one of the key things we needed to talk about is how all the some 2,500 people in the country who teach introductory astronomy are suddenly doing with having to teach it online. Imagine if you were a college instructor and you had to teach not only a group of maybe 80 or 100 students, but you had to teach them sometimes in small groups, sometimes as a whole class, you had to take them on an observing session. You had to have labs to teach them hands-on astronomy. How would you cope doing this online? And so we're going to have a whole thread during the meeting about how we're coping, how we're doing with uh, this challenge. And our plenary speaker for this thread will be uh, someone at the University of Arizona who's a, a very respected expert on astronomy education, Dr. Chris Impey. He will give the plenary talk on how we're doing, teaching astronomy 101 online. And then we're gonna have a series of panels and sessions, uh, whether you're a beginner in teaching astronomy, if this is your first time, or you're a veteran like me and you've been teaching since just after the Big Bang, uh, there'll be sessions appropriate for you. Um, uh, two well-known people in astronomy education, Adrienne Gauthier and Ed Prather will chair panel discussions on uh, tips and tricks, principles and practices for how you actually do Astronomy 101 remotely. And uh, uh, 
no, I'm going to stay with that for a second. And then uh, we'll have lots of other people talking about interesting developments. For example, uh, a number of people have turned their remote astronomy class into a game where as you learn, you're actually playing a game online and you score points which go toward your grade. And it makes astronomy a, a little bit less of a, of a chore and, and more of something that students can look forward to while at the same time maintaining some seriousness about learning astronomy in a, at a college level. So that should be a fun panel that we're going to have. And, and then there's a the whole issue of how do you test students? How do you give them quizzes and, and midterms uh, if, you're, if you're not in the same room with them? How do we keep things secure? How do we make students feel comfortable with this crazy online environment? So we'll be talking about that as well. And then uh, true to your heart, Scott, we're gonna be talking about observing. How can we help uh, students have an observing experience uh, while they are enrolled remotely, maybe from their home in an introductory class. Um, and so uh, there'll be a lot of sessions that I think all kinds of educators will enjoy. And then we'll move on to things that are more global. Uh, some of you may know Dr. Deborah Fisher, who is now at Yale, who was the first woman in history to discover a planet planet orbiting another star. And she and other astronomers have started a group called Astronomers for Planet Earth, an international collective that works to address the climate crisis uh, among astronomers and through the work of astronomers. So she's going to lead a whole discussion about how astronomers, both professional and amateur astronomers, can contribute to some of the issues around the uh, climate crisis that we're all experiencing. So. Uh, that'll be interesting. And then um, someone I like a lot, Derek Pitts of the Franklin Institute, who's often on television. And I know, Scott, you're a fan of his too. Um, he'll be part of a panel discussing uh, science museums and how they're adapting creatively uh, during the, the pandemic. Um, so even if you're uh, just a fan of science museums or planetariums, you might enjoy this session. Um, I should mention that the executive director of the Astronomical Society now is Linda Shore. She's a dynamic educator and uh, she will be chairing uh, the meeting and uh, behind the scenes, Greg Schultz, who is the education coordinator at the society has been organizing. And we've got about 130 people who will be participating, either giving uh, talks or video posters, sharing what they're doing and uh, we want to invite everybody who's interested in astronomy education, who may be listening to this, uh, to, to become part of the meeting. There is a, a modest uh, registration fee, but you can find out more about it. We do have scholarships, by the way, set up for people in community colleges and high schools who may not be able to, to have a budget for registration. Uh, you can apply for a scholarship to come to the meeting as well. So it'll all be happening online December 3 through 5. And again, there's the website you can go to, astrosociety.org. All right. So I put I'll that uh, website also. There. I put the website in chat for you. And um, right. uh, I, do, uh, I do apologize. The video is running a little bit long there. Normally, we have uh, just kind of a little bit of a buffer before we start with our first speaker. Right. But uh, and Anyhow, I'm sorry we didn't get this all aligned at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. We'll do this right. Thanks. Yeah, but I I'm, I love that you were able to spend some time with us, uh, 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 Andy, and we will uh, we will see you back next week uh, when we pick another day. And um, I know you have to get off to uh, uh, work on another um, uh, Zoom meeting right now. So right, but I again I I'm sorry about that, and next time we'll take much more time to talk in a leisurely way. So no problem. I, okay. I, I appreciate your understanding. Yeah, no problem. Thank All you. Right. Thank you very great, much. Great to Take talk care. with you. Yeah. Take care. Bye bye. Okay. All right. So so Kent, uh, we've come back to um, how to get started in astronomy. And uh, we ran through a bunch of telescopes already, uh, scopes that started out at about $150, going all the way up to about $1,000. Uh, 
you have um, uh, created uh, some pages. I don't know if they're live yet on uh, on uh, your selection, but uh, um, are, are those are those pages available for viewing? I don't think they're live yet. Okay. Uh, they're, they're built but not live. We need to work on that tomorrow. Okay. All right. But we'll get those up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, but you've moved on to binoculars. And yeah, so I circled back to where I started, basically. You know, personally, other than laying on the ground, my father was a, a, a big visual observer. Didn't buy his first telescope till he was uh, like 65 or 66 years old. Um, but we would go out and watch meteor showers and lunar eclipses and just literally lay the old wicker, green wicker lawn furniture and, you know, watch meteor showers. And... Uh, he had binoculars his whole life, and old military binoculars is what he had. And uh, today, the binoculars we have are, are so much better because the glass is better and the coatings are better. And the entry point for binoculars, people already have binoculars in many instances. And any binoculars with any magnification is better than going out with your own eyes. But if you're in the market for a pair of binoculars, and that's what this show is really about, is what's, you know, what's out there. We sell a pair of... National Geographic branded 10 by 50 binoculars. And, you know, okay, the astronomy is full of numbers. What does the 10 mean? The 10 means they've got a 10 power magnification eyepiece. And the 50 means that this end, the sky end, is 50 millimeters across. across. So it gives you magnification and diameter. And um, if you have 8 by 23s, that means they're 8 power and or in 32 or 23 or 25 or whatever. This is how much light comes in and this is how much magnification there is. And, you know, everybody in astronomy is gonna tell you 10 by 50s, right off the bat, 10 by 50s. And other binoculars will work, but 10 by 50s are generally, and it's what I recommend, the entry point. Binoculars are easy to use, they're light. Why is it that you recommend them? They're easy to use. They're yeah. light. Yeah. They're pretty well intuitive. If you look at it, yeah. You look at it and just put your eyes up to it and focus, you know. And there's a couple more things to know about that, you know, and how to focus the left eye and then turn this turn this knob for the right eye. Right. But you know, that's that's for another time. We're not doing a class on astronomy. And they're just and here's the reason: $39.99. $40. On our website, get great you price. That's a great price. I can't back in the 1980s when I was uh, first selling uh, uh, astronomy gear. I mean, you couldn't buy a pair of seven by fifty binoculars for forty bucks. They were hundred oh, no. dollars. You yeah, know? exactly. Uh, ten by fifties and even a little bit more. You know, so and, and to put that in perspective, that was a hundred bucks back in the 70s and early 80s. Man, it's not That's like gonna be one hundred and forty bucks today. One hundred and fifty dollars today. That's you right. Know? And so you're getting these, and you know this pair of binoculars comes with uh, end caps for both ends. Yeah. Um, comes with a nice carrying case and a neck strap. I just took these out of the box, so I'm not going to put the neck strap on. And right. a lens cleaning cloth. Okay. Right. So you know, great pair of binoculars right here. Or and the case, just the case and the lens cleaning cloth. Probably if you had to replace it, would be the price of the binoculars. Yeah, for sure. So. And we also sell this nifty device if you have a pair of binoculars. You can, and a tripod, most binoculars have this little piece right here. I keep covering my face up. This little piece right here that this unscrews and this hooks into, and this sets on your tripod. So instead of having to hold them up, your arms get tired after a while. You can use a tripod uh, to look at things, but looking at stuff over your head with a tripod like that is, is painful, potentially, because you can't get the tripod up enough. There's other techniques we can talk about, but... You know, again, we've talked about this before. The technique I use is I put on a ball cap, a fitted ball cap. Yeah. So that I put the put my elbows in like this, bring them up, press them into my eyes, and then right. reach up and grab the bill of my cap. And I can focus here, right? And now, because my elbows are locked in and I'm holding on the bill of my cap, the binoculars aren't sitting there bouncing up and down, and you can see deeper into the sky. And so that's a quick technique on how to how to use the binoculars a little bit better. We have a whole range of binoculars. Um, 
you know, starting out at $39, a great entry price. Yeah. If you have a little bit more money to spend and want to buy, and like anything else, a little bit more money means a little bit better materials, a little bit better glass in this case. You know, you can go up to uh, uh, the Alpen Magnaview 10 by 50s, uh, come in at $199. Um, they're a great pair of binoculars, this same design. I didn't grab the next level up, you know, the Bresser C-Series binoculars. Um, instead of having this zigzag design with a prism right here, they have a roof prism in them. So they're just like a, a pipe, more like a telescope and just a straight tube. Those start at $209. Those are fully multi-coated. Um, you got some money burning a hole in your pocket. You can get some really nice binoculars. The Alpen Apex 10 by 50s, $479. But those have special metallic coatings and special coatings. The difference between, you know, an inexpensive pair and a more expensive pair, you look at something that we've done it here uh, across the, the, the office in, in Scott's office. We get a new pair of binoculars in, in the same line. And we'll look through the current ones and then we'll look through the new ones. And it's like, Holy wow. Yeah, it, I know. It's impressive. And, you know, the, the, the improvement that has been made every three or four years in coating technology and glass development and polishing or whatever yeah. really, you know, makes binoculars better. And if you're using a 30 year old pair of binoculars and want to upgrade, go to a store and look at some modern binoculars and compare the differences. You, you may be shocked. But then again, you may look at the price and go, I'm shocked too, and I'm going to keep using my old ones. Nothing wrong with that. So, you know, that's a quick discussion of binoculars. I also recommend, you know, like always, you know, the red light flashlight and the planisphere, you know, which is, this is the Wiltarian multi-sided planisphere. You can get this planisphere and the red light flashlight for $29.99. So for, you know, $70, under $80, you're going to get a map of the sky, yeah. a red light you can put on it, and a pair of binoculars you can look up the side. Up the side. Like two telescopes, right? <laughs> binoculars are two telescopes, two little telescopes. Right. And because you're looking with both eyes, you see more than you do with one eye. That's the cool thing about binoculars. Right. So that's a quick rundown on binoculars. Um, we'll get this up on the website tomorrow. But I tell people the best thing you can do if you want to buy a telescope, start out with a pair of binoculars because you start learning the sky. Um, you start learning to see things and it's really an inexpensive way to get into the hobby. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was reading something last night about another subject and, and um, this struck me. A uh, guy was talking about fishing and he was talking about buying fishing rods for his kids. And he said, if you want your kids to enjoy fishing, you should buy your kids the same fishing rod you use. You shouldn't expect them to enjoy fishing when you use the little short kitty rods with their, you know, after a certain age with, you know, whatever your favorite character is, colors. If you want your kids who are eight, nine, 10 years old to go fishing, they should be using the same fishing equipment you have. Don't waste your money buying cheap fishing equipment for kids. Right. I thought that was a pretty interesting point because my dad took us fishing a lot and, you know, and I remember we, we used the same rods he did. And I think he, he never said it consciously, but I think he understood that if they, if you want the Andy and I, my brother to enjoy it, then use good gear. And, you know, the difference between toys binoculars and this pair of binoculars is right. only a few dollars, but one pair of binoculars is a toy and one pair of binoculars is a tool, you know, so enough of that. So you want to talk about planispheres real quick, Scott? Yeah. Oh, hang fair. on. Hang on. One other thing. <laughs> hang on. Let me lift both hands here. This is a pair of big boys. And they, get bigger than that. they get bigger than that. So. Oh, this is, this is only 20 by 50s. They make some monstrous by ones. 80s. Those are 80s. Yeah. yeah, 20 by 80s, excuse me. Right. But they make... You know, 30 by 100s, 30 by 120s, 50 by 160s. You know, if you want to spend the money, you can buy four inch or six inch binocular Newtonian telescopes side by side. I've never looked through one, Scott. You probably have. 
I was I, a pair of 20 inch binoculars one time. So and it was Ryan Nebula and it was unreal. Yeah. It was absolutely unreal. Yeah. So this is a great pair of binoculars. Um, don't have a price on them. Uh, but um, the problem is they're very big and they weigh probably four or five pounds, maybe. Right. And they're heavy here because the glass is the heavy part. And so you're continuously trying to hold them up and you can only hold these things up for a few minutes before your arms get exhausted and you can't look through anymore. That's where, you know, specialty mounts come in and there's all sorts of designs for those. So what's cool is, you know, this planetary ring, this thing is huge. I mean, it's just as big as the one behind me, right? Except that maybe not. And this is, this is one of Scott's ideas and where he comes up with these ideas, I don't, I don't know, but he hatches them when he doesn't sleep because Scott never sleeps. This is a big, big, big planisphere. Now, now you look small somehow, you know? Yeah. Like that little planisphere and. So this was a perspective of size and relationship is messed up right now. Yeah, I know it's, it's the perspective because here this one is. And it really, you know, starts messing with your mind, the perspective size. Um, he's got another one that's just a wee, wee bit bigger than this one. It's probably what, four I feet across, think Scott? I think it'll fit in the frame of the video. <laughs> Is it four feet across, five feet across? What's it's it going to be? Four feet across, yeah. And so anyway, this is a working, you know, planisphere. It's not double-sided although it may be in the future, um, but it's a working planisphere. And just like any planisphere, today is November the what? To 12th? November 12th, uh-huh. November the 12th, it's right there. And it's, <laughs> let's just say 5 p.m. So we now know that right now, this is what the sky looks like facing north. Now, the double-sided planisphere has the south side in the back. So if you go out right now, you're going to know that Lyra is right there. Right. And the ring nebula of this thing, we're going to have to deal with this thing turning. But as the night progresses, you can just continue to turn the time, 5 p.m., 6 p.m., and it shows you how the night sky is rotating right around as the time changes and Polaris is centered here and it has um, lots of M objects on it, all the constellations. This is really easy to see. Now, planetspheres do not have the planets on them because the planets move. And so you can't have a static map that shows the planets. It's just sort of reality. It does have the ecliptic path on there. You can but see it the shows you right here. Mm -hmm. the path of where the planets go. That's right. Okay. And so this green line is the celestial equator, which is yeah. just like the equator on, on our sky. And if we were low enough, we would be able to see, um, you know, some really low stuff in the sky. This goes down to zero to 60, I think, right? <clears throat> so anyway, I've talked to Scott about maybe we need to, because this is so big, there are other M objects, Messier objects on here that we should come back and add to the to this one. And, you know, we're working on a price for this one right now. And I know Scott has said what it is. And um, I think it'll be something less than a thousand dollars. Yeah, probably by a factor of five would be my guess. Um, no, I, I figure if we did sell this and I, I don't know that I will, but um, if we, they, they would have to be, you know, they, they would be made here. We have a very large printer. We print it out on, you know, photographic grade type of stock. They are custom cut out. Uh, you know, it has a custom window put on it and everything. It, it takes a little bit of work here to get one of these together. I was, I was um, very pleased with how it came out. Uh, I'm figuring that would retail for something like a couple of hundred bucks. But it's, it's something that is designed um, actually, I just designed, I thought of having it just for our showroom. I realized that it wasn't big enough for me to be in the showroom, so I wanted something bigger. But um, 
I think that if you are, you know, you have a, a telescope shop like Ray, Ray Khan's watching us right now. <laughs> I think if you have this on display, uh, it makes it easy to show customers um, what's up in the sky uh, for that night um, or to explain how a plan planisphere works. Uh, you know, if you are running uh, an astronomy club, you know, then, uh, you know, you could have this um, uh, on your own on-air programs like we're doing today or when we can finally get back together after COVID, uh, you know, you can teach uh, beginners how to use a planisphere effectively. Um, and, uh, you know, I, th I thought of it being like at the, uh, uh, the registration booth at star parties and stuff like that. So. Uh, you could put little stickers on there showing where the moon might be that night and planets that are up for that night, uh, meteor shower, um, that kind of thing. So, but a great, a great uh, kind of educational tool. Uh, the big four foot one I'm doing is uh, going to be at our showroom and um, uh, hopefully at the next NEF show that we can go to. So, but that, that's the, that's my evil plan. Uh, if you want one, say something. Let's got no. I mean, the more look, it's like anything else. The more demand there is, the more we have the impetus to, to begin mass producing these right. and not make them, especially one-off product, but develop it into a real product. So, if you're interested, let Scott know. You know, in, in the comments, we love to hear from you. Sure. Um, uh, wanted to recognize some of the people who are watching the show. Marco Pola, who was on our show yesterday, he's, he's uh, checking in. Hopefully you had a good night, Marco. Um, hope you got some good astrophotos and had a good time with your 10-inch daub. Nicholas Rocha says, hello guys, greetings from Argentina. Pekka saying uh, hello uh, from Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, we got uh, the Astro Beard, Richard Grace on. Uh, Ron Del Bo is on. Mike Wiesner is chiming in here. Uh, Jeff Wise, Norm Hughes, um, Book Davies has checked in here. Um, I think this is perhaps a new person here. Um, Mangisto Male uh, says, how, how do I get joy back into my life? I want to thank uh, for those who were able to get my... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. This sounds like a uh, a personal thing here. So, anyhow, um, <laughs> we're gonna block that guy. There we go. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, Book Davies is on with us. Um, let's see. Any comments here? Uh, Guitar God 1882 is on and wanted to know how uh, he could get help with his guiding. And it looks like he already did get help with Tyler Bowman, who was already watching this program. So um, Tyler's a good guy, does astrophotography, understands uh, how to get the best performance out of things. So, um, And he works for us. Yeah, and he works for us. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. So, so, Scott, I shared my screen. You said, you know, Mike Wiesner, yeah. which made me think of Mike Reynolds, which made me yeah, think of this book. Right. But no, binocular stargazing. It's it's a great book on on uh, binocular astronomy. It was uh, you know the Fords by David Levy. Uh, you know, uh, Mike passed on um, a while ago, uh, but I wanted to give him a shout out. He wrote some great books on astronomy. Uh, and, and the eclipses, and the, the, in particular, this great book on binocular stargazing, which there's not a lot of them out there. And so that's, this, is a, this is a good one to get into uh, if you like to do binocular astronomy, because it is different than using just a standard telescope, you know, so. So, you know, $14.95 on Amazon. It's uh, they've got 26 used and new from $4 and 90 cents. So, you know, you can pick up a used one for under $5. I mean, that's pretty darn cheap right there. That's you know, right. Save yourself some money. That's right. But so you can buy more telescopes. That's right. 
Yeah. So, so. Um, <laughs> Ray Khan is here. He was uh, poking some fun at us too, you know, which is which is totally cool. He says this this show is better than watching crazy cat videos on YouTube. I don't know. I might argue that. You know, those crazy cat videos are pretty funny. <laughs> um, okay, funny. Here's a joke. All right. And this is this is courtesy of Dr. Uh, Frack Noe. How many astronomers does it take to change a light bulb? So take a couple of seconds. We'll wait 30 seconds or a minute to see what people how they answer, answer the question. That question. That's, how many, the, answer, the, answer the joke. How many astronomers does it take to change a light bulb? Yes. Let's we'll see what the answer is. All right, go on, Scott. So you've seen this book, haven't you? I've not seen this book. Oh, I read the book when it first came out. It's it's you know it's well written. Um, uh, he gives you uh, you know technique on using binoculars, why you would want to use binoculars. I think every astronomer should have, with their arsenal of equipment, um, should have a pair of binoculars. You know, uh, there are uh, changes in the sky, how faint you could see. You know, you can check transparency with a pair of binoculars. Uh, there are some objects that are very well suited for binocular observing, you know, things like that whole uh, North American nebula complex, um, you know, with the pelican and all. Uh, the Orion looks stunning in a pair of binoculars. The Andromeda Galaxy, another one. Of course, comets, you know, you need binoculars for comets uh, for the most part if there's a big one. Um, and so um, it just seems like a must, you know, to have. <clears throat> and Mike Wiesner points out, and you can take images through one side of the binoculars using a smartphone. Uh, he says some smartphone adapters will work on, on the binoculars eyepiece, which is totally we need cool. to We need to have Mike on some time to talk about his how he does iPhone photography yeah, and the success whole, he has. We did a whole program on it, and he showed uh, step oh, by we, step. I missed that. I forgot that. Well, yeah. since we've done what a hunt between these and the other ones, we've done 140 or 150 shows. You lose, <laughs> lose track. Shows. Yeah, you lose track. That's right. That's right. All right. Did we get any answers to the to the joke? Anybody try to take a stab Let's at it? See. Let's see. Ray Khan says none. Astronomers don't change bulbs to minimize light pollution. Well, there you go. <laughs> That's right. Hi, Ray. Yeah. Good to have you on our show. Ray, you'll have to uh, join in sometime. Uh, happy to have you back on the show. Um, Mike Wiesner says he keeps a pair of binoculars in his observatory and uses them frequently. Uh, uh, David Samar, this summer I was spotting the comet with binos and then I would turn, turn to it with my telescope. And that's a great way to look at a comet. You know, I remember, you remember Hale-Bopp, okay? I remember looking at Hale Bob with uh, with binoculars, and of course it was just huge, filling the eyepiece field. And uh, you know, my I had seven by fifty binoculars, um, but uh, when I looked at it with a telescope and looked at the 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 head of the comet, I saw what looked like shells going around it, and I had only seen these kind of uh, these features before, like in drawings, and I thought that that was just kind of artistic interpretation of what a comet was. But I learned that, uh, in fact, that the comets can appear that way. And the reason why is because, think about it this way, if you have a jet of material shooting out one side of the comet, but it's spinning, as it spins around, the solar wind hits it and makes like this, this shell here and then a successive shell and another one. So as this thing's spinning around, it makes all these, uh, what looks like these, these Defined boundaries around the comet head, and uh, so it's, you're you're muted, Kent. Basically a spiral. Basically a spiral, but what it looks like is shell on top of shell on top of shell. So it's really cool, really cool. You know, one of my favorite uh, uh, binocular experiences happened at the Winter Star Party. Uh, Todd Longnecker and I were down with Paul and Kathy Anderson, and uh, Paul and I were going to do our Messier objects down there one night. Okay. Uh, Todd and I were. This is probably our second or third trip down. And we got into the Virgo cluster and we were looking for the guide stars in the Virgo cluster and we couldn't 
we just couldn't find the M objects. And after, I don't know, 30 or 45 minutes, it was, it was, we were beating ourselves up for not being able to see them. We, it was so dark that we realized that the guide stars we were looking at were actually the M objects. And we were seeing the M objects all along and we had, they were so bright and obvious. We felt like they were the guide stars we were looking for. And once we realized that it was like, okay, we knocked out all those, but you know, it was, it was pretty cool to see under dark skies to see that kind of, of, of uh, view and binoculars. And yeah. we banged out, I don't know, 70 or 80 that night and then clouds rolled in, you know, we would have gotten probably 90 or more that night. Um, but it was very enjoyable just to sit there on the beach, you know, looking up through binoculars all night long. You know, it was awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Well, I think it's fun to be like in, you know, those zero gravity chairs. I don't know if you've seen them, but they're recliner chairs. And uh, you just sit back there and bundle up, have your hot drink over there and uh, uh, maybe some music playing over here in your binoculars. And you're sitting back and looking at the Milky Way. It's just awesome. It's awesome. It, it, it's, uh, th that is a, you know, uh, that, that is truly soaking in the Milky Way, you know, so, so cool. Well, now something else I wanted to um, uh, have you talk a little bit about, uh, Kent, is the Explore Alliance and Explore Alliance membership. You've been running uh, uh, promotions, uh, special deals for Explore Alliance members that they can redeem either through us directly or they can redeem it through one of our participating dealers. Okay. Or, or they can call us and say, um, I use Ray Khan for Khan Scopes. Right. We'll take the order and we'll give him credit for the sale. So right. even even if they call us or email in to us, that's true. We will give them credit. We'll give their dealer the credit for the sale. That's right. That's, that's our right. way of supporting the dealers. That's right. So, um, uh, but uh, what is it that we have coming up? We have a couple of things coming up for deals. Okay. So right now we've got for paid members of the Explore Alliance, mm -hmm. and the Explore cool. Alliance is a care program that, depending on the level, gets you. Um, at platinum level, get you uh, advanced replacement if you have to send your telescope in. And if we have a telescope that we can send you like the one you have, uh, we'll send you a telescope to keep you up and running through. It may be here 30 or 45 days, keeps you up. A whole bunch of other stuff we won't go into. But if you're a paid member at the standard membership rate of $29.99, when we join, we send you a gift card for $30. If you join the platinum level for $99.99, we send you a $100 gift card. So you get your money back to spend um, on an Explore Scientific product. The specials we have going on for the paid members, uh, right now we have the two-in-one hybrid finder base. So if you've ever had a Explore Scientific telescope and wanted to put on a Celestron Mead, uh, Celestron sent to Orion finder scope, the feet are different. Likewise, if you have a, one of those telescopes and wanted to use your Mead or Explore Scientific finder scope, the foot's different. This finder piece, this base replaces either mm -hmm. telescope mm -hmm. and you can use either style. So you can, you can use Explore Scientific Mead or you can use the Senta Orion Celestron foot and be interchangeable. And I think it's going to be a pretty hot product. I don't remember the price, but it's like pushing 50% off what retail is going to be. Um, Cause Scott sprung this on me. We also have um, the uh, uh, two weather stations that we have. We have a, a five in one weather station mm -hmm. that is uh, a oh, tremendous no. price Sweet. off. It's, you have it there, Scott. I didn't bring no, the paper. I'll bring it up. I'll bring it up. That's two ninety nine, and I think we're selling it to EA members for one ninety nine, if memory serves. So you know, for and these prices I'm talking about are good for a limited time. It ends November, November the twentieth. Uh, the sale on those. We also have a little uh, uh, clock, um, atomic clock, for twenty nine ninety nine. And yeah, the, the weather station that you're talking about, the professional weather station, sells for less than that. But 
but it will be a terrific deal. Um, yeah, whatever uh, what the prices are. So you can see what it looks like here. Uh, here it is. But it's a terrific deal, short time. All you have to do is join the Explore Alliance and, and call your dealer, or you can uh, email explorealliance at explorescientific.com and we'll set you up. And if you want Raycon to get credit for it, just say Con Scopes is my dealer and we'll give him the credit for it. That's right. He'll miraculously get a credit for money that he didn't have to do anything other than thank you for being a dealer. Yeah. Supporting our products. That's right. So yeah. we also have the two man observing tent that is no longer on special, but if somebody today or tomorrow emailed me and said, Hey, Kent, I saw you on the, the first light chronicles by today or tomorrow. I'll say through the weekend, I'll be nice. And if I come in Monday morning, I've got an email from you. Uh, Monday being, what would that date be, Scott? Um, Monday? Yeah, what's Monday's date? Because uh, this is going to exist long after Monday. 16th. 16th. Uh, December, uh, November 16th, 2020. Yeah. I come in, I find an email from you over the weekend saying, I want to get the pop up 10 at the uh, EA member price. Don't tell Scott, but I'll give it to you. I'm not supposed to do that, but <laughs> don't tell Scott. And uh, right. we'll get, it's a two man pop up tent. It's a, it's on the website. Uh, we don't have them in yet. As soon as they come in, we'll get them shipped. Yep. The weather stations, they're here. The little atomic clocks, they're in the building and they'll ship. Yeah. Yeah. So the little atomic clock is uh, this, this is one in the box here. And, uh, uh, let's see if I can show you. They come Two colors, here. one's white, one's black. Yeah, so I got a white one right here. It makes a really nice display with nice big numerals and stuff, so it's very cool. And it's under, the, the deal is significantly under $20 for EA paid members right now. If you've got somebody that you want to buy a stocking stuffer for, that's a great one right there. Yeah. Comes with batteries, by the way. So. It comes with batteries? It comes with batteries. I was like, what? <laughs> I mean, the batteries, you know, if you went off and bought a set of batteries for it, it would... How many batteries does it take? Two? Two double A's? Uh, it's three triple A's. Three triple A's. So it doesn't even take something crazy and expensive. Right. So, that's right. So. Anyhow. Well, that's great. Um, Kent, uh, I think that's that's our show for today. Um, uh, we had some nice comments from the chat um, about uh, binoculars and um, uh, getting started in astrophotography. Uh, Tyler, um, Tyler's working from home today, um, but uh, I was going to ask him to come on the show. But of course, we have. I, I'll run a video with uh, Tyler talking about the astrophotography contest that's coming up. Um, and uh, we will see you tomorrow. There's, we will not have a global star party this Friday, um, but uh, next Tuesday we will. And then on, let's see, I wanted to give Mount Wilson Observatory a shout out. Let me just double check that date again. Uh, on November 24th, we are supposed to have a live tour through the Mount Wilson Observatory. And on this show? On the this, Global Star, the global star uh, Party? It, it will be, it will replace the uh, Global Star Party. And so Starts at 7 o'clock? Uh, sorry? 7 o'clock p.m. Central Time. It, it will start, it will start, uh, I think about, um, I think it will start at about 5 p.m. our time. Okay. Which would be? 3 o'clock their time. Okay. One, which would be, Global Time would be? What, uh, universal time? Yeah. 11 I, universal I time? I always have to look. Oh, but, is it five? Yeah, so we're going to be... 11. We, we will go... Uh, there'll be a, a live tour inside the 100 inch. There'll be a live tour through the 60 inch. Maybe, possibly, they'll do a sunset view through the 150 foot solar tower. <coughs> And uh, uh, we are expecting to have a special lecture with a Carnegie astro astronomer uh, on that day. And then get this, weather permitting, uh, we, we will have live imaging through the 60 inch telescope. So 
Uh, that should be a real treat for, for you. Uh, you know, Mount Wilson is such a historic uh, observatory. Um, uh, the, we've also talked about having a special astrophotography contest, not with, astro, not with captures done by other astrophotographers, but actually it's an image processing contest. And they're going to release the high resolution, I mean the full resolution image file that they digitized of the historic uh, images taken at Mount Wilson. So images like the discovery of the CFID variable nebula, for example, or C the CFID uh, variable star in uh, M31 that, uh, you know, proved the, that, uh, you know, that the Andromeda galaxy was, was not a nebula. It wasn't a spiral nebula. It was another galaxy, another universe of stars. Overnight in 1923, I forget the exact date, but um, uh, we went from thinking that the universe was maybe a couple hundred thousand light years in size to now millions of light years, uh, and, and now today billions of light years in, in size. So uh, very, very cool. Um, but they have a lot of iconic images, including there's one a shot of the uh, Orion Nebula. It was the test shot that George Ritchie did of the Orion Nebula through the 60 inch. I've done some image processing on it myself and I'm not as good as you know, guys like Gary Palmer or you know, Adam Block or these people that really know uh, how to uh, really work the image. Um, um, but we're gonna open it up to all of them and there'll be a contest on uh, on uh, through the Mount Wilson Observatory itself, which I think is totally cool. I think it would be cool just to work on something as historic and as iconic as those images. So, uh, but we'll be talking about that as well. Uh, it'll be a lot of fun. We want to connect you with Mount Wilson Observatory. Uh, that is a uh, iconic um, uh, observatory itself that um, uh, deserves your support. Um, so, used to be and is still called America's Observatory. So, so that's that's all I have for tonight. Is there anything else you'd like to add? So Scott, it'll be, if it starts at five o'clock, it'll be 23 UTC. Okay. Just checked it to make sure. 2300, <clears throat> 11 o'clock. And also, UTC. Hubble announced on December 30th, 1924, that the universe was a wee bit bigger than they thought. So, you know, that date is coming up. That needs to be. Is it 1924 or 1920? Was it 24? 24 is what I just looked up. Yeah. 24. Okay. All right. So that's that's what I'm thinking. That's about. a huge anniversary. Think about that. It's been less than 100 years. Yeah. Since we found out there was a, the universe out there, not just the Milky Way. Not just the Milky Way. Yeah. yeah. I have an old, or I had an old Simon Newcomb book on astronomy. I gave it away. Uh, and Simon Newcomb was, uh, you know, a revered astronomer of his, of his time, an, an American astronomer. And he describes a tour through our universe, okay? And he talks about getting to the edge of the Milky Way. And, you know, in your imaginary spacecraft, you know, after traveling uh, 100 or 200,000 miles, uh, million or 200,000 light years, not millions of light years, but light years, um, and looking back and seeing the glow of the Milky Way and looking forward and not seeing, just seeing a void, like that's, that's the edge of the universe. So, but uh, we know it's different now. And uh, anyhow, it's always cool to, to go back into history and see these things. The, the look back though and the recordings, the data that was recorded at uh, Mount Wilson is still uh, referenced today. Um, and uh, you know, thank goodness for the people that have saved the plates and stuff. There was a once upon a time they were gonna get destroyed, but they, they have been saved and collected and uh, preserved at uh, Carnegie uh, Institute in Pasadena, so. So anyhow, we will uh, wrap this up. And thanks for watching. And um, as Jack Horkheimer always said, keep looking up, right? <laughs> That's right. And we will see you uh, hey tomorrow. everybody. Thanks, thanks for coming. With uh, Jerry Hubble. Take care.
Hi guys, this is Tyler, customer service rep with Explore Scientific. And today I'm here to announce that the Explore Alliance is excited to be hosting the first astrophotography contest to recognize the excellent work of the images of our members' ranks. For this initial contest, we are looking for the best of the best in seven imaging categories, from deep space objects to planetary, lunar, solar, wide field, time lapse, and terrestrial. Prizes will be awarded in each category. First place winner will receive a $200 Explore Scientific gift card, an upgrade in their Explore Alliance membership, and a 24 by 36 mounted print for their winning image. Second place winners will receive a $150 Explore Scientific gift card, an upgrade to their Explore Alliance membership, and an 18 by 24 mounted print for their winning image, and third place will receive a $100 Explore Scientific gift card, an upgrade to their Explore Alliance membership, and 11 by 17 print of their winning image. Best in Show will be selected from the first place winners in each of the seven categories. The Best of Show will receive a 24 by 44 mountain print of their winning image in place of the 36 by 24 first place prize. Entries are being accepted through 6 a.m. Central Standard Time to December 24th of 2020. Now before each entry, please be aware of the following rules and requirements. Each entrant must be an Explore Alliance member. If you are not an Explore Alliance member, it is a free program and we will provide you a link in the below in the description so you can sign up. At least one piece of Explore Scientific equipment, telescope, or mount must be used in the capture of the submitted image. Entrants must identify equipment and imaging data in the appropriate sections on the form below. Each entry must be the original work of the entrant. By entering, you are stating that the image is your property and the work that you originally have. Although the contestant entry period is through December 24, 2020, images outside the taken contestant time periods are eligible for entry. Entrants must read and agree to abide by the rules and photo release at the time of submission. These are the included on the form below. Entrants may enter more than one photo into the contest contest. Again, this is Tyler, a customer service rep, along with Explore Alliance. We really hope to see your astrophotography images, and we can't wait to see what you can produce. Again, this is Tyler. Clear skies and keep looking up. So we're going to do